Okay, doggy, doggy. We are going to start a little, you know, interlude before I introduce the rest of Mark 13 and how it interacts with Matthew 24 and Luke 21 because this chapter here, very famous chapter by John, always misinterpreted. Well, maybe not misinterpreted, but the guesses are kind of, you know, all over the place. This little chapter here is actually talking back to, talking back to, I gotta keep my voice down. I'm gonna almost talk in a whisper, okay? This chapter is talking back to Matthew 24 and 25 and talking back to Luke 21 and especially talking back to Ephesians 1 okay the reference with the Rome and the seven mountains is where that's going to become most relevant especially to us today that's the name of the sect that's backing Donald Trump ooh problem you can google on this you can google the best best thing to do would be in YouTube because the people who are of that sect are busy explaining the seven mountains, how they think that's going to lead them to God. Which is why you know Matthew 25, 11 applies to them. Because they're knocking on what they think is the door of their Savior by going into politics. That's what the seven mountains to them mean. Whether it's Pat Robertson or Raphael Cruz or James Dobson, Lance Wallnau, a whole bunch of people are in that movement. All the people who are telling you how great Trump is, they belong to a sect they call seven mountains. But that's in Revelation 17, and it's a condemnation. Yeah, that's how screwed up these people are. They are trying to achieve the very thing God is warning against. Sorry, I'm yelling. The very thing that God is warning against in this chapter. And then the question, of course, is, well, where is he getting it from? He's getting it from Ephesians 1, which was the first 490 years of Western Rome couched in typical Greek drama, nice language, but it really meant something else. All Greek drama was like that because you could get actually killed for criticizing the state. Alright? And I've already done the, vi the videos on that in, um, the, in Vimeo, the Paul Meter GGS 11 channel. Okay, but Luke also playing on Matthew 24. I didn't know that when I did the Paul videos on Ephesians. I didn't know that Paul was getting it from Matthew 24. Until Anone Nominon, a Frank Forum, brought it to my attention. And that same guy, Anone Nominon, is right now playing with the meter in Revelation 17. So this is a sort of heads up. I don't know what the results are going to be. He's doing it. And then we always go back and forth to, to change it. But for sure you know. Because of the emphasis on Constantine. And I'm going to prove why this is talking about Constantine. That okay. Constantine was all about unity of church and state. The Seven Mountains people. When you hear them talk on YouTube, including Raphael Cruz, Lance Wallnau, Pat Robertson doesn't talk about it very much, Sarah Palin. Well, that's what they want, to unify church and state. They maintain that the Constitution was really not intended to, rule, to, to separate Christianity. Really? That's sure not what we're looking at here, and that's sure not what my Constitution says. I don't know what Constitution they're looking at, but if they're reversing the meaning of seven mountains here in Revelation 17, you can bet that they don't read the Constitution right either. That's why we're making this little video. Okay. So now we come here, and we're just going to look mostly at translation, because it's, you know, John is one of, when you just start out learning Greek, in seminary they give you John. John's got the easiest to read Greek. It's, it's, he uses small words but they've got profound satirical meaning and you have to you know you can be deceived easily as to the meaning of what John writes. 
if you just go by the simplicity of the words. You know, somebody who can write in simple words and make a thing clear, that person's pretty profound. It's a very difficult thing to do. You know, a whole lot of scholars and politicians especially, they use lots of big words and flowery words all the time. And basically, you know, they don't have a clue what they're saying and you won't either, either but you're impressed. John is the opposite of that. And therefore, he's much more impressive. So let's go through Revelation 17. And now that you see the relevance of it to you right now, because this is the name, Seven Mountains, Google it or type it in in YouTube. Seven Mountains is the name of the Christians backing Trump. It's more like a federation. It's not exactly a denomination. But it's a set of principles they all agree to. That Christians are supposed to be politically active in order to, to make this a Christian nation. Which is the exact opposite of what Christ said in John 18.36. But if they're reversing seven mountains here and thinking it's a compliment rather than a condemnation. Then of course they're going to reverse scripture on pro-life. Because they're all pro-lifers. Pro-life is totally anti-biblical. And they're also going to reverse John 18.36 where Christ says... My kingdom is not of this world. Who doesn't know that verse? Okay, so then how come all these seven mountains people are reversing that verse and say, Oh, well, when Christ said my kingdom is not of this world, it must mean that we should be at politically active in this world. No. If that was what we should be, as Christ told Pilate in context in John 18, Look, if I w this was all about politics and winning in this world, I would just call down and the angels would deliver me, but my kingdom is not of this world. Same answer he gave to Satan in Matthew 4. What's the third temptation of Matthew 4? Oh, so then all the Christians that are around Donald Trump are absolutely the opposite of what the Bible says. Yeah, but they're not the only ones. It's just, this is just a way for you to know, oh yeah, this interpretation of Matthew 25, 11, the syllable counts are at our year. How do you know it's Trump? Well, here's how you know. Okay? Even if you didn't know that Matthew 25 passage, seven mountains. Okay, so now we're going to cover up well, what does the seven mountains originally mean? To prove that they sure don't know. But you will. So here we go. Look. Revelation 17. You've read this a thousand times. I'm just going to go through it really quickly. Until I get to the key. One of the seven angels who had the seven balls. This this isn't bowl. It's vial. V-I-A-L. Okay. Came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I'll show you the judgment of the great harlot. Who sits on many waters. Now, in order to know what harlot means, it's a metaphor. And waters means it's also a metaphor. You'd have to know how those terms are used in the Bible. The trouble is, is that in English, it's not always translated with the word harlot. It is usually translated with the word waters. Like Isaiah 55. Okay, you who thirst. When waters is used in the plural, and you'll see that again, um, this is a common term that's used um, by John, especially back in uh, Revelation 13. Waters refers to politics. Harlot also refers to politics. Here's the difference. Water signifies the like geographical extent. Okay, you know, like there's a, there the one set of waters is by the United States. You got the Pacific and the Atlantic. You got another set of waters, especially in this the time this is written, which is the Mediterranean, which was considered to be a Roman sea. Rome was very much a Mediterranean center. Okay, she controlled the Mediterranean. And that's why the word waters is used, because it's, it's got the connotation of 
every single country everywhere in the world and yes they knew the world was round and that it rotated and that it, it, it did a circuit around the sun that's been known since Job at least since Job which is older Hebrew people think than Genesis 1 okay so now okay well then waters everybody knew that was the whole world see many waters not just one so that's referring to the geographic distribution of people and the waters of politics, you know, like tides and push-pull. And in, in ancient times, water was not, you know, water is plural, was not something that you, how do you want to call it? You were afraid. Okay? When you went, especially in the Mediterranean, when you wanted to go, say, from Ephesus to Rome, Okay, there was a good chance you wouldn't make it if you went by sea. It depended on what time of the year you went. Remember the story about how Paul got shipwrecked? There are a lot of shipwrecks. Because it's an enclosed space of water. It's really big, but to the, you know, to the winds, it's not so big. And those winds start stirring up. It's like trying to stir up. Have you ever, you, you know, when you pour in some detergent into a dish basin? and then you pour the water into it you'll see how it starts moving around the and it builds suds and stuff but the water actually moves it doesn't just stay in place until it's filled up well that's what wind does to an enclosed space of water and that's why there's so many there were so many storms and shipwrecks so the connotation of a, you know a metaphor of waters to politics it's talking about the back and forth and the really real potential of death. You know, Joe Blow gets in power and he's king now and he's no sooner king for five minutes and the next guy behind him wants to depose him and so they all figure out a way to assassinate him and then the new guy's in charge and five minutes later he gets assassinated. You know, that's the story of history. That's why Waters is used. Harlot has a quite different significance. Okay, because it's going to be important to understand in this passage what we're what we're looking at. If you if you view harlot in the Bible, you'll find it most poignantly depicted. The meaning most poignantly depicted in Ezekiel six. I mean, my pastor liked to tell the story. You know, he's dead now, but back when he was first starting out as a pastor, once he got into the Hebrew of Ezekiel six and he decided to teach what it really said, not what was politically acceptable. Um, he said he lost all but about 35 of his congregation. Okay. Because it's so, um, what do you want to call it, blunt. And what is the blunt meaning in Ezekiel 6? Oh, Israel is being unfaithful to God. She's running after other husbands. So she's a harlot. A harlot is a really, is it, you know, 19th century word. It means whore. It, it it means some it means somebody see the difference in English between the word prostitute, call girl, and whore is a matter of price. The cheapest ones are called whores. And a nicer word for that, I don't know if you really want to call it nicer, but a nicer nineteenth century word for the same thing is harlot. The next level up in price will cost a little more is a prostitute not necessarily a lot more the highest price is call girl and we use those terms even today a whore and as in Ezekiel 6 it, she got at the end of it she was so um, interested in having sex with anybody who'd have it with her that she would pay them to have sex with her that's all that's all in Ezekiel 6 I didn't make that up I learned it from listening to my pastor exegete it and you can, you know, it's rbtheme.org. You can go get the tapes yourself and listen to them. I mean, well, they're not tapes now. They're on MP3. You hear it yourself. Okay? I've just, you know, this was back in the, I want to say, what was it, 1970s? No, earlier. 60s. He might have redone it. But, you know, go listen to that because that's how you get a real keen sense of what har harlot always means in the Bible. A believer who is 
picking somebody other than God as a lover. Okay? You know, Christ is supposed to be the bridegroom of the church, so we're, you know, the same analogy applies to us Christians. It's not just Israel. Israel is a prototype of humanity. Okay? And the believers among them, you know, obviously got saved. The unbelievers among them do not get saved. That's the subject of um, Romans 9 and someplace else, but I forget right now. The point is, is that harlot means a believer. It means you're going to heaven. You got saved. You have God's righteousness imputed to you. You know, um, five, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21. All right, 20, 20 or 20, 21. And instead of being with your husband, oh yeah, the other passage is Romans 6. Instead of being with your husband, well, you're just harlotting around with anybody else, i.e. politics. See, harlot who sits. Don't make me explain why they're using the word sits, okay? You should know that. On many waters so she's having sex with politics instead of her husband you get that see how vivid it is see how obvious it is because you can just look this up anywhere in the Bible you want it's just you're just gonna have to think that's radically you can't just use the word harlot all right and you have to know that waters is a metaphor for politics and if you search on the waters uses in the Bible you'll see that that th this is pretty commonly known, by the way. I mean, the, 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 no matter what the denomination, they all kind of know that these two meanings are what I just told you. Alright? Now, with whom the kings of the earth committed morality. See? There you go. In case you weren't sure that it was politics, the next verse makes it clear that they are committing acts of immorality. With what? Believers. And by extension, the place of believers. And by extension, going all the way back to the Old Testament, Israel was originally that place. But of course, now we're talking church. And how do I know that? Give me a few minutes, because i got to go through this. The kings of the earth committed immorality. Well, what's immoral? Well, you're supposed to be married to Christ. And therefore, his, your kingdom is not of this world. But if you don't like your husband, then you're going to fornicate with politics. And that's why it's immoral. This, see, this isn't too hard to understand. And those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. I mean, what do you do when you're, when you're having sex with the wrong person? You kind of need to get drunk so that you don't, your conscience doesn't bother you so much and you can have more fun. Okay, and he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And this is a, a vision thing, okay. Wilderness is a, verse, is a, is a tag to um, Matthew 24, all right. Desert is really what it means. And I saw a woman, uh, see, another metaphor, harlot, woman. Sitting on a scarlet beast. Scarlet. Scarlet was the color that they used in Rome for the religious Pontifex Maximus. Scarlet is, of course, the color that's used in Rome today by the Vatican. But this isn't, strictly speaking, the Catholic Church, which is one of the many misconceptions about this passage that's been going on for a long time. Calvin in particular made that popular. He was convinced that this passage only refers to the Catholic Church. Not realizing that it also referred to him. How do I know that? Well, just wait a few more minutes. Full blasphemous name. Now what is a blasphemous name? Oh, you know, politics. You're blaspheming God if you go into politics as a substitute God, you're, you're blaspheming him because you're saying, A, he's not enough. B, he's not really a ruler. C, he's not really your husband. D, um, this other method of you doing it your way, like the woman in the garden eating the fruit. 
is true and right and good and God ought to reward it. That's blaspheming him. That's blaspheming the cross. See, because if you can do something to get you credit before God, then you're saying Christ's payment on the cross wasn't good enough. I, if that's not blasphemy, I don't know what is. Okay, John 16, 9, he just threw that at me. Concerning sin because they do not believe in me. So in effect, even if you're a Christian and you're saved, you're saying you don't believe in his payment. You gotta go into politics. See, see how evil this is and see how provably condemnatory it is. Having seven heads, this is where everybody gets all confused. Seven heads and ten horns. Heads is the, is like kings, heads of heads of state. Okay, horns is a metaphor in the Bible going all the way through the Old Testament. It's a metaphor of power. Okay, now a lot of people interpret the ten horns to mean ten countries. You know, because your source of your power as the head of a country is the country. You know, that's where you get your military from. That's where you get your taxes from. That's where you get your voice from. That's where you get your power to enact your will from. Okay. So, your typical, depends on what denomination you talk to, your typical teaching about this, and my pastor got confused about it too in the, be in the beginning, is that, okay, there are seven kings, uh, well, maybe ten kings, but, like, they don't last. Of course, this is a reference back to Daniel. Alright, specifically Daniel 7. You know, the first vision. And so, you know, John is tagging Daniel here. But the question is, what does this mean, seven heads and ten horns? Is it seven kings? Or ten kings. Well, in Daniel, if you look back, it was originally ten kings, but three get condensed into one. So it's like a federation of some kind that happens. So your typical teacher, who's a dispensationalist, all right, will tell you, okay, well, um, that means that the future revived Roman Empire will consist of ten countries. You know, Hal Lindsey did this kind of stuff. Will consist of ten countries, and three of them will coalesce. All thinking about the geography. Not paying any attention to the fact that since Constantine, everybody's been trying to recreate Rome all right but not necessarily over the same geographical area. For example, if you go and you listen to Paul Friedman, who's a professor of history at Yale, and you can find his videos right here on YouTube, just type in, well, I'll put a link in the video description or in the comments. He spends time explaining that the Byzantine Empire, and that's going to be real important to what I'm going to show you, the Byzantine Empire, which lasted until 1453, always built itself out as the Roman Empire versus Italy, which was the original Roman Empire. Now, are you getting the point? He's not saying that it has to be Rome physically. Although, we're going to get into that more too. Alright? It thinks of itself the way Rome thought of itself. And that's the key. A Roman model. A Roman paradigm. Ancient Rome's paradigm. That's exactly what... Daniel says in Daniel 9.26 the people of the prince who will come. Okay? It doesn't mean literally the same people alive at the time the first temple went down. It means that the people who took down the first temple are, as it were, the paradigm for the ones who are going to be at the end in the official tribulation. Okay, but it's not the same humans. 
the humans are long dead. So what is the tie? The tie is the thought pattern. The tie is the government structure. The tie is what was Rome and whoever it's going to be in this passage is billing itself out to be Rome. A successor to Rome on the same model. Well, what does that mean, the same model? Well, what was the essence of Rome? Do you ever think about it? The essence of Rome was a unity of church and state. The emperor was a Pontifex Maximus, Scarlet. But he was also the emperor of Rome, King. Now, in Rome, the kings wore purple. Sorry, this thing isn't the, the highlighter is in blue. Purple. Purple in Rome at the time that um, John is writing this, which is actually 88 AD. He uses the meter to dateline it, but we'll get confirmation from Anoni Nomenon when he's done if this chapter was also written in 88 AD. Purple was the color. And in fact, it isn't purple the way we think of purple. Okay? It was a special kind of purple. Ma made by a um, special kind of worms. And that, that particular color of purple was only allowed to be worn by, it, it, as the way it ended up turning out, by the emperor and his family okay especially in Byzantine times but before the Byzantiums got started by Constantine even in Augustus Caesar's day and at the time this is written it's Domitian um, there was a special kind of color purple that was unique to the royal house well they didn't call themselves royal um, but it was unique to them and nobody else could wear it okay so king and priesthood, religion, Pontifex Maximus, united in one person, united in one government. You'll notice that in, since the analogy is here to Rome, in Rome, you had, as it were, any kind of religion you wanted, except you could, if you were a Christian or a Jew, they didn't like you. All right, but anybody else, it was okay because you were always like polytheistic, and and the, the gods of your particular location were to be venerated. So if you were in Ephesus and they had their local gods, then Rome would honor those gods in Ephesus. But at home in Rome, well, it was like the Roman gods. And they had little, little, all kinds of little practices that they did. So as long as you honored their gods, they would honor your gods. And honor meant like pouring wine out on the ground. Really kind of stupid practices. So long as you followed the prescribed practices of outward piety, they didn't care if you believed in those gods or not. But if you refused to engage in those superficial practices like scarlet you know wearing the colors wearing the fancy robes and the fancy hats and the intoning and the blah 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 if you wouldn't do that then they didn't like you they consider you to be ateos impious literally atheist okay so this is the joining of religion and state that was the essence of what seven mountains meant and why seven mountains because that was the nickname of the Romans that they gave themselves they called themselves seven hills the seven hills of Rome that was based on the original patriarchal families that were up on the hills because the actual Rome itself was a swamp it was really stinky and bad so they'd stay up and live up on the hills in order to get good air. 
and they came to pride themselves on that. And there were there were seven hills. They had specific names, and if you lived on those hills, you were the cat's meow baby. You were important. You were a patrician. Okay. So that's how Rome got started, and that's what the Romans called themselves. So we know for sure it's the Roman model, but not necessarily physically the Rome that we know today. Okay? Now what am I trying to set up here? It might be, but it might not be, a repeat geographical configuration that's centered on the Vatican. It could really be any country in the world now associating itself with other countries because this is still some kind of federation. You've got seven kings here. That's what Daniel's depicting too in Daniel 7. And it was initially ten that condenses to seven. So three of them sort of like merge. Okay. That for sure. And for sure it's based on the Roman, ancient Roman at the time that John's on Patmos the mission ruling model. But today, you know, in those days, there was only the Rome. Rome was the only Roman model. Okay, but today, every single country on earth has a system of government, at least superficially, which is modeled after ancient Rome at the time John's writing. They vary in whether or not church and state are separated and how much. For example, in England, the queen is the equivalent of the, the emperor with Pontifex Maximus. She is the head of the Anglican church. Okay? And that's an outgrowth of Constantine. Now I gotta get to you how you know that, that that Constantine is the initial guy that they're talking about here. But do you see the point about unity of church and state? That's state, kings. That's church. Well, that's religion. I haven't yet proven to you why it's church. You know, understand? You understand about the blasphemy? You understand what the seven means? And you understand what the ten means? What you didn't know because nobody's ever talked about it this way is that, well, but anybody that tries to revive Rome or has the same structure and ideas as Rome, now, I don't mean like, you know, they have gladiators and they use Roman words and they have stadiums and stuff. You know, Rome was an idea. That's why it became an empire. It was a successful idea. And every country on earth now has its constitution and its essential structure the same as ancient Rome. We are all children of Rome. No matter what our culture is. In other words, the Chinese government is still very much Chinese. You can't take the, ch you know, no, no amount of communism is going to stop China from being China. But at the same time, China itself, when it started, and as it grew, changed very much into the same idea as Rome. Because they also had the idea of unity of church and state. Same thing with Japan. The emperor was deemed to be put there by God. Same with ancient Egypt. Okay? So Rome herself is like an outgrowth of this same trend that's always been going on in history. Alright? But today's world... We separate church and state. Most con I don't know of any constitution except perhaps Britain, but I think they do too. I don't know of any constitution which doesn't separate church and state. So the people around Trump calling themselves Seven Mountains? Oh, well the big exception of course would be the Muslims. But even their constitutions are secular. So the people around Trump calling themselves Seven Mountains? They obviously don't know how to read this chapter. Or they would never they would never be talking about it. I mean, just listen to Raphael Cruz and YouTube talk about Seven Mountains or Lance Wallnow. Both of whom well, Wallnow himself is, is, is you know, talks to Trump. 
I don't know if Raphael Cruz does, but both of them belong to the same sect that believe in this their version of really this is all Romanism. Everything that's here is what they're preaching as good. Bible says no harlot. So now let's go. How do we know it's Rome? Seven mountains is how we know. And I gotta say more about that in a minute. And how do we know it's church? Okay, well here we go. Babylon. Babylon's always a picture of, of massive apostasy. Babylon is where Israel went when the first temple went down. Babylon is the name of the place that took her. It was actually in the book of Nazar. That's Dan what the book of Daniel talks about. And that's why in Daniel 7 is what it is. Because Babylon was the start of it. Babylon was also unity of church and state. Remember the big tall statue that, that Nebuchadnezzar wanted everybody to worship? Alright. That was after he got the vision in Daniel 2. Daniel 7 is an advance on that vision. Alright, the whole thing is it's a progressive revelation about the future of history. But you'd have to really study it to know that, and most people don't. The mother of harlots. See? So, Rome is a child of Babylon in terms of what? Its structure, its style, its belief system, its unity of church and state. See, it's a paradigm. Daniel 2 is a product of the whole history and it's all one body, one person becoming progressively more, you know, screwed up as you get down to the feet, which is wrong. Okay? So it's a paradigm. It's not necessarily the same geographical location. Babylon the Great, mother of harlots. Yeah, see, you're depending on politics rather than God. You're drooling over Caesar rather than God. You're going after the, you know, the, the false gods, ultimate thought, and the abomination of the earth. Abomination. That means to desolate. That means to put something, let's see, how would you call it? It is an abomination for, I mean, well, you, I can't think of a couple who wouldn't think of it this way. If some man came in and raped your wife, you would call that an abomination. If some woman came in, and there is such a thing, it's not, you don't hear about it much, and raped your husband, it does happen. Because men don't have, I mean, you know, there's certain things you can do to a man, even if he doesn't want it, and, you know, that part of his anatomy is just going to react. So it's, it, there's such a thing as female rape. Females raping men. It does happen. All right? And that's an abomination. A man would consider himself to be abominated if a woman raped him. And it is, it is possible to do. And vice versa, of course. And, of course, the spouses of either one of those would call that an abomination. If someone came in and did the same thing to your kids, you would call that an abomination. Why? Because it, like, completely ruins. It's a ruining experience. And yeah, you can get over it, just like you can rebuild on top of ruined buildings. But you don't lose the you don't lose the memory. There's something that just dies from that point forward. Okay. Trump is an abomination in the presidency. But the United States will come to see that one of these days. And that's what this is actually saying. The the paradigm is Babylon. The paradigm for Rome was Babylon. Mother of harlots. Mother of going after religion rather than God. Mother of, um, of going after politics rather than God. Remember the harlot is sitting on waters. The harlot is a, an unfaithful believer who's running after someone other than her husband. Which means religion. Religion is always a substitute for God. That's what's so evil about it. And that's like an abomination. Okay? Abominations of the earth. Okay, and I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints. Why? Because when you go after politics rather than God, you have to crucify or go after and kill 
anybody who's got who's who's actually faithful to him because you're not and the blood of the witnesses of Jesus now here's where we start to get into proof that this is Constantine I mean I could go further about this also but I'm going to cover that later okay we know it's church because of this word mystery musterion musterion in Greek means a doctrine known to the members of a sect and unknown to those outside it Paul is the poster boy for that word Paul is the one who started using mystery to refer to church it was given to me the mystery see he's that's his testimony about it I want to say it's in Ephesians uh, 3 okay the new changeover what what what's this thing with church now the doctrine of the mystery and specifically John is tagging Paul at Ephesians 1 9 because Paul uses the word mystery as a pregnancy word see mother Paul always uses mystery in the con in content uh, in the context of pregnancy mothering he always uses it that way okay whenever you see mystery you're gonna find some kind of reference somewhere to pregnancy and mothering and in Ephesians 1 9 the meter there is pointing at the Severan mothers okay who first come into power under Septimius Severus and then after he dies and Caracalla is murdered they come back into power killing Macrinus okay in 219 AD and Paul benchmarks that alright he benchmarks that as a turning point in history and it is a turning point in history but if you don't know the history, you don't know why. I didn't know. I had to go look it up. Why is he referencing 215, 216? I didn't know that there was such a thing as, as the Severan Mothers. Or if I did, I forgot. So mystery, pregnancy, mothering. So very clearly, John is tagging Paul. And the meter will know when, and only Norman gets done with the meter, will know what he's, what, year he's hitting on here but I already know what verse from the keywords all right mother of harlots and abomination harlotry is what the seven seven mothers claimed that they should get back into power after Caracalla was murdered because the kids that they were saying should be the rightful emperors were actually the product of incest Eliogabalus and Severus Alexander See, he's making reference to the future, John is. But you can prove it with history. Alright? So that's still Rome. It's later. It's still the paradigm on the model of Babylon. Rome is the model of Babylon, and all the countries today are on the model of Rome. So anybody could be in the future. Babylon, mother of harlots. Any country on earth might be that person you know the the reference here in other words it could be China it could be India it could be Latin America it could be the US and that's the danger we're facing today because it could be the US see seven mountains there's no other place in the world I know of right now that's calling itself seven mountains and is basically saying He's basically treating all of this as if it would be a good thing instead of the condemnation God is making it out to be. So the U.S. could be the home of the Antichrist. If the rapture happens tomorrow, it will be. Because there's nobody else trying to do this but the United States right now. That's even if I didn't know the meter, but I do. And with the meter, it's even more certain because this is tagging Ephesians 1 9. This is tagging Ephesians 1 9, which was about a period of women behind the throne trying to do the very thing uniting religion and state, 
they use Telia Gabalus to say, oh, well, see, he's the current reincarnation of the sun god. And, you know, and so that's unity of the king and religion. And they were priestesses from a Syrian, a royal house of Syrians. And you can find all that in a book by Barbara Levick called Julia Domna. Or you can find it out just by looking it up. I mean, there's a lot of writing about this period. Uh, Barely also wrote about Septimius Severus, so you can go read him. He's really good. I, I did reviews on his book some months ago. So you can read on these people, okay? Septimius Severus, then after him was his son Caracalla, then a, then a guy named Macrinus wanted to be emperor for a day, and he murdered Caracalla, and then within a year of him having done that, the, the, sep the mother's, you know, Septimia Severus' wife and her two sisters or nieces or something, they end up getting into power claiming that that incest occurred. Okay? Incest occurred. And that's why you should have us back into power because our t these two boys here, they were like 18, 16, 15, these two boys are the product of incest, and so the blood of Caracalla lives on. Which is a big lie. But hey, Donald Trump isn't the first guy to make a lie to get power. Alright? And in the next segment, I'm going to pick up more, because I'm afraid that I might not be recording all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs>